I'm just going to introduce the folks who are going to um, do the tumor board. This is um, something that we do typically for folks who are dealing with malignancy of many different kinds, um, who are dealing with situations that aren't necessarily straightforward. Um, we highlighted two areas today that, uh, as you'll see, are somewhat controversial. There are pros and cons to each of the approaches that were ultimately taken for these patients. But the idea is to give you a sense of the kind of discussion and sort of review of the situation that we go through when people are in this sort of a situation and how we make these decisions. So I'm going to turn it, I'm actually going to introduce everybody here. So on your far left is Dr. Nick Reeder. He's one of our um, GU pathologists. Uh, Dr. Dan Lin, who's chief of urologic oncology. Dr. Jing Zhang, who's our uh, premier radiation oncologist. Dr. Larry True, our uh, very well-known GU pathologist. And Dr. Yu, professor here and uh, medical oncologist extraordinaire. So I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, great. Thanks, Bruce. We'll just trade seats here, and I'll come up here. I'll turn this off for now, because I'll just speak up here. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, so uh, we have a couple interesting cases today, and uh, the first case is a patient that uh, I saw here as well, and then Bruce uh, is going to present a second case as well, Dr. Montgomery will. So this case, we're going to call this Mr. E, and he's a patient of mine that was 56 years old when I first met him, and he had what we call biochemically recurrent prostate cancer. So he was actually an ex-Olympic athlete. Uh, I believe it was the decathlon. Um, but he had had a primary treatment to his prostate cancer. His PSA had started to rise, and he had had a very strong aversion to androgen deprivation therapy or hormonal therapy as we call it. Uh, lots of hot flashes, feeling depressed, it wasn't his favorite thing to do. So he obviously wanted treatment for his rising PSA, but he just wasn't excited about the idea of getting any hormonal therapy, not surprised. So um, this is basically his whole history and I'm going to present it to everybody here. So in 2011, his PSA was 2.5 and he was just age 50. And then in 2013, his PSA increased to 10. It was just being monitored. And then he underwent a prostate needle biopsy. I apologize for the spelling error or the typo there. But this revealed a Gleason 4 plus 3 equals 7 prostate cancer in 5 out of 12 biopsy cores. He had a standard bone scan at the time uh, that was unremarkable. And he had an MRI that revealed some question of whether this had spread outside the prostate capsule and might have involved the seminal vesicles, which at that point we would call it a T3B status. That's how we would stage it there. And uh, he underwent robot-assisted prostatectomy. And this also revealed what we call a pathologic T3B. So it did involve the seminal vesicles. And he had nodal involvement, lymph nodes. It had spread to the lymph nodes. The Gleason was 4 plus 3 equals 7, and positive surgical margins. So before we go any further, I'd like to ask our expert panel um, if they have any thoughts, any questions about this presentation, this history, uh, or any comments to add at this point in time. Looks like Dr. Lin. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, a couple points on this. A couple of points on this that I think are instructive. Number one, it says PSA was 2.5 at age 50. So as many of you in the room know, a normal PSA should be less than four. And you, you hear that all the time, normal PSA is less than four. However, a man at age 50, the average PSA for a man at age 50 is probably 0 0.7, 0 0.8. But most people don't know that. In fact, most physicians don't know that. So, and, and when I go around the country, I talk to family physicians and internal medicine people, and they say, oh, well, the PSA was normal. It was three. Well, the guy's 50. Well, that's two standard deviations above, if not more. There is actually a movement across the country and world to have measurements of PSA at age 50, and if it's less than one, maybe go every five years. And if a man has a PSA of less than one at age 60, maybe no more PSAs ever, because there's almost, almost no chance at all. I bet this man had prostate cancer at age 50. I'm almost sure he had prostate cancer at age 50, or very close to it, because he, uh, he was considered pretty high at age 50 already, and three or four years later, or two or three years later, he had prostate cancer diagnosed. So that's number one. Um, number two, this four plus three, and, and I think that a lot, of, a lot of pathologists, and this is maybe for Dr. True or, or Dr. Reeder about the pathology of four plus three. Well, was it four plus three in every core? Or was it three plus three and a couple, and then a little bit of four, and uh, you know what percentage of four? Was it cribiform four? And these are the kind of discussions we have. 
when we get together in our tumor boards and talk about this kind of a case. Yeah, so um, as Dan said, uh, when, we, um, when we analyze the pathology of the cancer in the needle core biopsies, we actually generate a pretty complex set of data where for each one of the needle cores, we estimate the proportion of that needle core in which there is cancer, and we also um, estimate the per relative percentages of Gleason pattern 3 and Gleason pattern 4, because there is a correlation between those percentages, fractions, and what the likelihood is of the cancer progressing. And then a more recent thing, and this hasn't been incorporated in, into standard practice, but since Dan mentioned it, I'll just talk a little bit more about that. And that is the cribriform variant of prostate cancer could be that type of Gleason pattern 4, which is more likely to progress. So there are about half a dozen papers at least out about that, pointing that out. And we've been accumulating that information over the last, uh, oh, at least three years. So we're going to be able to uh, retrospectively, prospectively look at the predictive um, value of that. Um, final thing also is in the needle core biopsy, sometimes we can actually stage it and we can see if the cancer is outside of the prostate in a needle core biopsy if it includes the extra prostatic tissue. So those are, that's some, oh, maybe a final comment also. We give an estimate of the composite Gleason score. And so there we look at the, all of the, all of the cancer and all of the cores, the Gleason grades in each one of the cores, and then we give an estimate of the overall uh, composite, therefore, of the cancer, making the assumption that the same cancer is being sampled in all the needle cores. Okay. So here we are, July 2013. He's had surgery, and unfortunately, it's involved the seminal vesicles. It's also involved the lymph nodes. And his PSA after surgery goes down to 0 0.47. And unfortunately, it's confirmed to be persistent, which nobody likes. We like to see an undetectable PSA after surgery. So at that point in time, he underwent what we call sodium fluoride PET, which is a sensitive PET imaging modality to pick up bone metastases at that time, but it was unremarkable. He then starts on androgen deprivation therapy in February 2014. Um, and then receives radiation therapy uh, from May 7th to June 30th, 2014. 6,840 centigrade, 38 fractions, 180 centigrade daily over 54 days to the prostatic bed, also to the pelvic lymph node areas, and then a boost to the area, to the fossa, to the bed. After 21 months, and we had planned to go longer with androgen deprivation therapy, he was sick of the androgen deprivation therapy of the hormones and said, that's it, I'm stopping it, I'm feeling depressed, I'm having a lot of hot flashes, it's really ruining my quality of life, and he was tired with it. His uh, PSA nicely had gone to undetectable, as one might expect with somebody undergoing testosterone-lowering therapy, but then it started to rise, and in October 31st, 2016, it was 0.07, then you see it went up to 0.13, 0.45, and 0 0.98. So what does our tumor board think about this case at this point in time in regards to um, how typical, atypical this is and um, prognosis, thoughts about anything? Yeah. Well, the first thing, one of the first things I look at is, is how fast the PSA is doubling. So we talked about doubling time. If you kind of just take an eyeball there, that's it's it's really a couple months, right? Two or three months, it's pretty fast. So we think in terms of less than three months being pretty fast, maybe more than a year being acceptable or slow. So that's the first thing that goes through my mind. I guess the question for Jing is, is so when it says the pelvic nose, how high does it go up and boost? So how high? Do, how much of the pelvic nose do you cover with uh, with the radiation? Yeah, so um, there are a number of kind of unknowns and areas of controversy in this particular kind of situation. A lot of the time when I see a patient who's had surgery to have their prostate removed, but there's still PSA and it's going up, um, they come to see me to talk about the possibility of radiation treatment. And one question they very reasonably ask is, well, my prostate's gone, so what are you treating? 
And so, you know, we, what we're doing is we're taking an educated guess at where we think there are still cancer cells in the body. So for this particular patient, at the time of the prostatectomy, they had what we called positive margins, meaning that, you know, where the cutting happened, there were some cancer cells there. And so we're guessing, making an educated guess, that there are probably some cancer cells left behind on the other side of that cut. And so if we use radiation to treat everything that the prostate used to touch, hopefully we are able to get all the cancer cells that are left over. Um, for the scenario where there's actually lymph nodes found to be involved at the time of surgery, we traditionally will treat lymph nodes going up to about, about L5 kind of vertebral body. And the reason we do that is from actually decades old surgery data where they plot it out. If you have prostate cancer and it goes to the lymph nodes, where in the body do the, where are the lymph nodes that it tends to go to? And kind of prop plotting out that that tends to be about the level where, you know, we can treat it without causing a lot of side effects, but still get most of the lymph nodes that the prostate cancer tends to like to spread to. And so in this scenario, it sounds like they did that, but unfortunately now the PSA is going up again. So the thought is that probably it may have escaped somewhere outside of the treatment area that was treated, or it's also possible that the radiation didn't work and that there's still cancer growing even where we treated it previously. So now the question is what to do next and where do we think the cancer is? Well, I'm going to ask you that question, Dr. Sang, because <laughs> unfortunately, I'm still disappointed, but your radiation, I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to say it didn't work, but the PSA is still rising. So what would you consider as next options here? So I think, you know, in the good old days when we just had CT scans and bone scans, we would do those scans for this patient. Mm -hmm. It would overwhelmingly most likely show absolutely no evidence of cancer in the body because they're not sensitive enough to pick up something when your PSA is less than one. And we would say, we don't know where it's coming from, but it's coming from somewhere. <clears throat> and now what are the pros and cons of restarting androgen deprivation therapy versus waiting a little longer? for that scenario. So, but now we have all these new fancy scans. We should get one of those and see what it shows. I like it. So we did get a new fancy scan. And uh, now we have Oxygen Pet here, which is phenomenal and it's very good. But at that time, it was just pretty soon after that, that Oxygen Pet came to our center. So this patient did undergo PSMA Pet. And um, well, does our audience here, do you guys want to help us with this uh, imaging interpretation? Anything abnormal that you see there? Since half my patients call me a radiologist, I'll give it a go. <laughs> so. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I think in the image on the left there, um, what you're seeing is a cross-section of the body around the lower lumbar vertebral body, kind of around the top of the sacrum. And the kind of orange light in the front, that's what we call physiologic, meaning it's in the bowel and that's just a normal. Um, but there is a bright spot kind of on the back on a scan like this, left is right, right is left. And so there's a lymph node there that seems to be showing some abnormal uptake on the scan. And maybe I'll let Dr. Lin. Yeah, Dr. Lin. Well, okay. oh, yeah. I guess the question is what? Right here. Yeah, right there. Good point, yeah. yeah good Dr. Point. Lin, what, what else could that be? Oh, I, it could be, so for PSMA, and that's one of the things we talked about this morning, PSMA, that, that thing that you inject is actually excreted in your urine, and the ureter from the kidney that goes down is, is right there. So I'm not sure what they said about it in their report, but it could be, it could be ureter, it could be just from urine. Yeah, they weren't 100% sure, so it made it right. a little bit tough. So here's another, okay, they thought it could be... Um a right common iliac lymph node involved with cancer, but it could easily be mistaken for ureteral activity as well. So they took another cut and they, they take a look here, and this is another potential lymph node or track along that area yeah. there. Higher up, that's yeah, higher, higher up. up. Still could be ureter though. Yeah, still could be ureter, could be tracked higher up as well. So, and that, that's why the, the oxygen is better because it, 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 it does, wouldn't show that. Yeah, right. that's a good point. So, I thought it was a second right common iliac lymph node, but it could also be mistaken for ureteral activity. Well, real quick before you go on, so would would the lower one have been in your field? So the low, but this one wouldn't have. Yeah. This too is high. the bifurcation too high. Okay. Too high. I love it how the surgeon points out what's too high for the radiation oncologist. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> All right. Good one, Dan. That was so subtle. <laughs> Now what about this? This is, a, this is pretty subtle, right? Anybody want to take a gander on this one? You see anything that looks kind of funny there? 
Well, that's pretty bright, right? <laughs> that's your liver. <laughs> this is very subtle, but they thought that there might be something here in the fourth rib. Very, very subtle here, okay? So it's real question mark here. Not sure. Right? What do our expert radiologists think? Where's the supracorvicular thing up there? See it? Over in the neck? You're talking about this? Is it thyroid? No, no, no. Oh, 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 I see. Yeah. I know. I got stuck there. Oh, sorry. I'm pushing the wrong buttons now. <laughs> you made me nervous. I was liking it, Evan. Yeah. Yeah, because you, you like what's coming next. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty nonspecific, right? We don't know. I mean, it, it's pretty questionable. And so this is the honest truth is this is what happens. And we're going to be seeing more and more of this as we do the super sensitive imaging modalities with next generation imaging, whether it's with cycling, PSMA, choline, whatever. We're finding things and we're not sure about it. So, but we know as PSA is going up. So this left subtle fourth rib activity is pretty questionable as well. And we know after his PET imaging occurred, his PSA kept going up. It went up to 1.4 to 2.61. He doesn't want androgen deprivation therapy, and we have to do something about it. So what, did, what, what would, well, you didn't do this, but, you know, there's a few options here, right? What could the options be before we move on? Dr. Zhang? So I think earlier when we were, um, when I gave my talk, I mentioned that, for example, this is a scenario where we could give a repeat round of radiation to that whole lymph node chain, um, the lower portion of which would overlap with the prior radiation the patient already received, um, but the upper portion was untreated, so we can do SBRT to the lymph node. Um, another option, of course, is to actually take out the lymph node. And I'll say that, you know, I think a lot of people say which one is better, surgery versus radiation. There are pros and cons to both. But one advantage that Dr. Lin will always have over me is he will provide tissue for our pathologist, whereas I will never provide tissue for our pathologist. <laughs> yeah, we, talk, we touched about this earlier today where we have been doing a fair number of patients where we've gone in and taken out those bright hot spots. Whenever we do that, at least when I do that, I always take out the additional lymph nodes that are adjacent. And oftentimes we find, well, we almost 100% have found cancer in those lighted ones, but we often have found cancer in the lymph nodes that did not light up. So that's why we always do both. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to move it along. This patient went to surgery, had a laparoscopic lymph node dissection, and looks like totally normal lymph node, right, Dr. True? <laughs> <laughs> Evan, we're all getting sensitized to your leading <laughs> questions that lead us down the wrong path. All right. So all appreciate right. it. So what we see here is a lymph node which is predominantly replaced by cancer. Yeah. And so we see fields. It's the pinker cells here. So the lymphocytes have a, they, they appear blue because they have a very high nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. The cancer cells, a lot of pink because there's a cytoplasm of, in this case, it's adenocarcinoma. So here... Metastatic tumor, the PSA is up, probably adenocarcinoma. There are a couple of immunotools that we can use if there's any question about the adenocarcinoma coming from another site. NKX 3.1 seems to be the most sensitive, but in a case like this where the clinical scenario is that, the only question I have, would have is, oh, that might be posed to me is, is it a small cell carcinoma? And it's not, just given the histology. Right. Okay, so two out of 11 lymph nodes resected were positive for metastatic prostate cancer, and the largest focus was surprisingly 1.3 centimeters. All right, the PSA trends at that point went down to undetectable, and they've remained undetectable, so it's a nice story to this point. And uh, at that point in time, we originally had talked about potentially, the patient had seen Dr. Zhang, and had talked about maybe starting on androgen deprivation therapy, which he really didn't like, but we thought it might be a good idea to do a little radiation there and give him androgen deprivation therapy. But given how nice his PSAs have been, uh, he's decided to defer on any additional therapy and just observe right now. His quality of life's real excellent. He's very happy. He's not suffering from any debilitating hot flashes or depression. And again, um, since, on the, uh, since we're running a little short on time, there is some randomized data now um, that basically shows 
that if you do this strategy where you're doing metastasis-directed therapy, you can delay the time until patients receive androgen deprivation therapy. It's not a definitive endpoint like overall survival, but you can delay the time until androgen deprivation therapy. And for patients like this who have a real aversion and terrible side effects, it's not an, uh, you know, it's not, it's not an unreasonable strategy to approach. Okay, so this is just some of the data from that. The one thing I'll say is this is not for everyone. Okay, it's likely not beneficial for every patient. If you have a very short PSA doubling time and it's moving really fast, if you already have, you know, really high volume bulky disease, or you already have had androgen deprivation therapy and the disease is already castration resistant, the PSA is rising, the disease is progressing when you're on androgen deprivation therapy, those are not ideal settings. So this is really, we are showing you a very unique situation where this may have offered some benefit in this situation, okay? It's also not ideal for somebody with really indolent disease, really slow growing disease. So some people afterwards, the PSA comes up and it just kind of hangs out and doesn't go up at all and just hangs out, hangs out. And what Dr. Lin brought up or Dr. Zhang brought up earlier with PSA doubling time makes a lot of sense. If it's not doubling pretty fast and it's taken a long time to double, you may never need any other treatment. So we don't want to do this to everybody because, you know, any treatment has side effects potentially. So you always need to consider the extra risks of surgery or radiation. And with that, I'll pass it off to Dr. Montgomery and he can invite some other panelists up. Thank you. That was very entertaining. Dr. Yu should uh, <laughs> not keep his day job. All right, so um, we're going to shift gears a little bit. So this, um, the focus of the second case is actually a little bit about precision oncology. And I'm actually going to um, invite Dr. Schweitzer to talk about the case, if you want to move up here, um, since it's his patient, and uh, describe some of the components to his presentation. All right, so this is a 70-year-old guy um, when we first met. Um, but essentially what happened was he, he presented with a very high PSA, 100, and is, had a high Gleason score, too. It was a total score of 8. So that right there tells you he's very high risk for um, uh, local therapies not really working that well. Um, regardless of that, he did end up uh, having scans which didn't show cancer had spread. So he did have his uh, cancer treated with definitive local therapy. In this case, he got androgen deprivation therapy in combination with radiation. Um, during the course of that, his PSA fell to a low point of 0 0.8, but while he was still on the androgen deprivation therapy following radiation, the PSA started to rise, which is really concerning that he's now got really rapid development of castration-resistant cancer in spite of the fact that he had already had radiation within the past year or so. Um, at the point when his PSA was rising, we did repeat his imaging studies, and it showed that he had a bone scan, which demonstrated cancer had already spread to his bones. So shortly after that, we did go ahead and put him on uh, enzalutamide, one of these drugs that blocks testosterone from binding the receptor. And this resulted in the PSA falling down to 4.35, but this was pretty transient. Uh, that low point was reached in January, so just a couple of months after starting the drug. And then it started slowly drifting up again. And by June of the following year, he had already developed symptoms. He was having pain in his hip, and he ended up getting radiation to that area to help alleviate the discomfort. Um, in October, so this is about a year after having started enzalutamide, he switched to abiraterone, which is a testosterone uh, lowering agent. His PSA at that time was 38, and it did drop all the way down to 4.5 um, by the following year. Um, but again, he developed rapid progression again, um, and this time he was having pain and had to get more radiation. And so um, I guess I don't know if I should turn it over to the panel to discuss this, or if you want me to just give away what happened next, or... Yeah, okay, let's keep going. All right, on the panel. So this is uh, his bone scan, and you can see that he's got some abnormal uptake. Uh, you want to give it a stab at it, Bruce? I'm going to try to get everyone involved here. <laughs> Let me just uh, take this. So, um, again, not being a radiologist, uh, as Dr. Not being a radiologist, like Dr. Singh. Um, so this is a bone scan, for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, is this working? I'm going to stand no, over you here. You got to point yep. out the screen. Yeah, sorry. So, um, Tom, Tom. there you go. There we go. So, this is an abnormality in his right hip, essentially, um, and these are all basically the same pictures. This is the front. This is the back. This is that, and that was before he was having difficulties. And so, this 
is subsequent. Now it doesn't look that different, but you can actually see that there's more extension higher up, right up in there. And if you're looking from behind, there are more areas from behind. And if we look at the CT scan, so this is a, a, a cut sort of front-wise, whoops, back. And so the areas that are, this is again on the, on the left, this one, this was his pre-scan uh, and this is the subsequent scan. And you, in prostate cancer, you can see bone areas that are involved become whiter. Um, they don't make holes, they actually make the bone denser. So you can see that there was more disease there. And then same thing here. So this was the pre, and then subsequently you could see more involvement of, of the bone down in this area. So there was very clear progression on scans along with um, having had symptoms. And these were the areas that he subsequently had radiation for. So we, um, as part of these tumor boards, we always look at the pathology um, as part of the discussion. I'm actually going to have Dr. Reeder talk about the, the pathology. Sure. So I can show you the uh, original prostate biopsy and go through our thought process. The first thing we think about, is there cancer or no cancer? In this case, it's quite obvious there is cancer. Um, in the second thing we think about is how extensive is the cancer? Um, how much of the tissue does it replace? In, in this case, uh, it's quite extensive, extends for much of the core. And then what we do is we go from low magnification to medium magnification for, uh, uh, to grade the cancer. And what we see here is the primary pattern is Gleason pattern four, and we don't see any other patterns, so that's why we call it a four plus four, both the primary and secondary patterns are Gleason pattern four. And then finally, what we'll do on high magnification is uh, give a couple more data points for our clinicians. And one of them is what type of pattern four is this? And this is a crib cribriform variant, which uh, as we covered earlier, there's some papers to suggest that might be more aggressive. And then the second thing that we'll cover is in Gleason four plus fours in particular, we consider the possibility of ductal carcinoma, and in this case, it doesn't have the features that we're looking for, which is elongation of the cells and nuclei and cells kind of piling on top of each other, or what we call pseudostratification. So this is a cribiform uh, adenocarcinoma, no ductal features. Great. So um, at this point, um, one of the questions that always comes up is, um, should we be doing something trying to figure out what is driving this cancer? And so um, what was done, actually, um, when people have metastatic cancer, there are different ways of getting tissue. So you can sequence the primary cancer, what Dr. Reeder just showed, which is the prostate biopsies, or you can get specimens, metastatic specimens, by doing needle biopsies of either lymph nodes or bone, or you can do what's called circulating tumor DNA, which is just a blood draw. And this gentleman had a blood draw um, trying to determine if there was something else that we could target in his tumor. Uh, and the upshot of that evaluation, which was done through our local um, assay, it's called Oncoplex, which is a very specific type of um, genetic sequencing, found something called microsatellite instability. Now, we've heard about that multiple times over the course of the day. Actually, um, Dr. Lee just a few minutes ago mentioned this. Um, and it's what's called hypermutated tumor, where that is... The, the tumor has many, many mutations all the way across all of the chromosomes, which make it possible for the immune system to recognize it as foreign. So there were also, there's always more than one mutation in, in these tumors. The others, though, were not necessarily targetable. So at the end of the precision tumor board, and this gentleman was presented at, uh, specifically at our sequencing tumor board, um, these were sort of the discussions. That is, because he had an MSA high tumor, um, we could potentially consider pembrolizumab, which is FDA approved for his tumor specifically. Um, the FOXA was not something we could look at. And then the question then is, um, well, first, I, I did want to touch on this issue of um, ctDNA because it is uh, something that we all think of as full of potential. And actually, Dr. Nelson and Dr. Schweitzer have been working in this area. Do you want to just comment on sort of the pros and cons of ctDNA? Yeah. So uh, CTDNA is just circulating tumor DNA. So 
when you've got a, a tumor, like a cancer, it's going to shed some of that DNA into your bloodstream. And we've got technology now where you can actually discriminate between what the normal DNA is versus what's the cancer-derived DNA in the blood. And so a major pro of that is that you can get information about the genetics of the cancer without having to do a biopsy, which is a big deal because I'm sure as many people in the room know, biopsies aren't fun. They have complications. It's painful. There's a number of reasons why we'd love to not have to do them anymore. Um, one of the issues is that, you know, you don't have as much genetic material from the blood as you do from getting a big chunk of a cancer. And so it's not quite as sensitive. And there are cases when you, you just aren't going to be able to get usable information. So it's, it's really, in our experience, most appropriate for somebody who's got cancer that's not well controlled, where the PSAs may be higher, where they've got more cancer you can see on scan. That just indicates that you're going to have a higher likelihood of a successful study. But in those circumstances, we've been doing the CT DNA sequencing, you know, over doing a biopsy since obviously we love to avoid doing that for our patients. Um, another advantage in theory is that, you know, if somebody has, say, two tumors and you were going to get sequencing done through getting a piece of the tumor through a biopsy, you're only going to biopsy one spot. And so that's only going to tell you what's going on with what, that one specific tumor. If you do CT DNA sequencing, you in theory are getting information about DNA from all of the cancer because they're all shedding DNA into the circulation. So that's another, I think, very powerful piece of information that you can get from CT DNA that you can't get from just sequencing a tumor that you biopsy. Sure. So at any rate, um, when, when, we, when we talked about options, you know, the standard ones out there at this point that I, I would, you know, offer to anybody who didn't have any, uh, you know, genetic alterations that we could target would probably be chemotherapy. Docetaxel's uh, one of the most common drugs we'd use in this situation. Another consideration would be for uh, radium-223, which is a, an intravenous drug that basically results in radiation being deposited at sites of bone metastatic prostate cancer. It won't affect cancer in the lymph nodes or the soft tissues, but if it's just in the bone, that's reasonable. And so that's an option for this guy, too. Um, but the thing that we really focused on was pembrolizumab. This is one of those immune checkpoints that Dr. Lee talked about. Basically what it does is it takes the brakes off the immune system, allowing it to become hyperactivated and hopefully attack the cancer. Now your run-of-the-mill prostate cancer doesn't look that abnormal to the immune system. So oftentimes it doesn't really bat an eye or think to even go after it. But when you have one of these hypermutated mismatch repair deficient cancers, they're really bizarre looking. They've got a lot of unusual proteins that the immune system looks at and should say, hey, you don't belong in this body. Let's attack it. The cancer knows how to shut that off, though. It knows how to turn the immune system down. When you use a drug like pembrolizumab, it flips the immune system back on again. And so that's what we chose for him because I think, you know, on a fundamental level, if you can harness the body's own immune system to attack the cancer, that's, that's been proven to be very effective in certain, certain settings. Um, you know, I guess you want to talk a little bit about uh, toxicity issues and that kind of stuff. Well, I think it was mentioned earlier. I think there are, you know, the, the incredible potential of immunotherapy is something that we all want to harness for every patient. Um, there are downsides and they are not minor when they happen. I think it's worthwhile emphasizing that. If something has no toxicity, then there is certainly no downside. Uh, I would say that we certainly see um, a significant amount of toxicity um, for anybody who's treated with immunotherapies. And so the the pros and the cons have to be discussed at the time that the decisions are made. Yeah. And I think, you know, especially when we're looking at options, including chemotherapy as being one of the main viable options for this guy, other than immune therapy, you know, in my experience, I think immunotherapy for most patients is, is probably better tolerated unless you develop one of those serious complications, which probably happen in 10, 15% of patients or so. And in those patients, it can be really, really a big deal. But you know, I think when you're sort of weighing the risks and benefits of potential treatment, I think, you know, for this patient, it made sense to proceed with it. So we just mentioned that we, we do always present other studies that we know about. So um, nationally, th there were two studies that were available for this patient, something called MATCH, which is actually a local study as well. We are participating in that, where patients who um, have gone through standard therapies and have a specific mutation can get access to off-label drugs if they have a mutation for which a drug exists. And he would have been eligible for that, although again, because pembrolizumab was standard of care at that point, um, participating in that research wasn't necessarily the thing to do. And there, there was another study specifically looking at checkpoint inhibitors for um, patients with these mutations. 
So it's worthwhile emphasizing this. It was mentioned, but it's something that's, when you actually see what the data is, it's really pretty remarkable. So this was the paper that established the utility of this. So these were all patients who had mismatch repair deficient tumors of many different types. Um, and this is what the use of pembrolizumab did. Now these were all patients with advanced metastatic disease. And you can see out to three years, half of those patients had not progressed. And some of these patients were pretty clearly cured. So this is the fairly dramatic potential benefit of immunotherapy in the right patient. And so this really panned out well for this patient. Um, as, as we sort of were hoping and expected, he had a really great response to pembrolizumab. You can see at the time of treatment, his, his PSA wasn't terribly high at that point, but he was still having a lot of symptoms. Remember, he was in pain from his cancer being in the bone. Um, and his PSA was just about 10, and almost immediately after starting pembrolizumab, his PSA has dropped down to nearly undetectable. And, you know, I can tell you that this extends out further than here at this point, and, and he's, he's doing really quite, quite well. He's feeling better. He's not having pain like he used to, and it's, it's a real success story, and he's, he's, doing, he's doing great. So one of the things that comes up in talking about giving immunotherapy is why doesn't everybody respond? In prostate cancer in particular, as Dr. Lee talked about earlier, um, the initial trials were all completely negative. And so the questions are mostly in, actually I don't have Dr. Lee up here, but one of us can stand in. So the question is why doesn't prostate cancer respond more like some of the other diseases that we treat like melanoma or bladder cancer or some of these other diseases? And do you want to comment? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's there's data out there where they've they've looked at the landscape of total number of mutations across multiple tumor types, and what's pretty clear is the ones that, on average, respond better to immune therapies have a higher number of mutations. So, like your melanomas, your smoking-related cancer, uh, lung cancers, um, and when you look at prostate cancer, on average, it's got not that many mutations. And what that means is that if you don't have a lot of mutations then there's not going to be quite as many abnormal proteins and just playing the odds. The chances the immune system is going to recognize the cancer is looking foreign, it's looking like it doesn't belong, it's just lower. So except for this subset that we just talked about, this hypermutated subset, um, most prostate cancers don't seem to have really robust response rates. Some patients still do respond, even in the absence of hypermutation. And I think understanding what made those patients respond is really important. I think thinking about strategies to help to make all prostate cancers respond is sort of where we need to go as a field. We've got a, a study that we're, we're designing right now, which will hopefully open up later this year, where we're, we're looking at one strategy to try to make these prostate tumors hot, inflamed, with the idea being that that's going to allow drugs like pembrolizumab to work for more patients. And we'll be using a novel drug, which is, is really quite well tolerated in combination with pembrolizumab to try to drive increased response rates in those settings. So hopefully that's something that we'll have available for, for our patients in the near future, too. Yeah, and it's just worthwhile emphasizing that um, a lot of this work that has led to these various therapies that we now use, including the checkpoint inhibitors for hypermutated cancers, came from work research, looking at mutations, doing sequencing, doing biopsies. So, you know, the, the cliche is if you don't look, you're not going to find. So we are going to be looking. Great. Thank you.